Hello, and welcome back to Daddy Roll to One. I'm Martin, and this is another video in my series on how I plan for a campaign and the individual sessions within that campaign. This is actually part three, so I'm going to be talking about the second session that I held with this group and some of the things that came up during this session and how I plan for them. So if you haven't watched the other two videos first on session zero and then also the very first session, you might want to check those out first. As a reminder, we are using the 1981 Moldvay basic rules for this game, D&D rules. If you're not familiar with this edition, uh, go ahead and check out my video on the history of D&D editions to learn a little bit more. So I'm using this and then also this game, Old School Essentials, which is essentially the same thing. Um, I hate to keep doing that saying essentially when it's called Old School Essentials, but it is the same game. It's a retro clone, though. So what this does is just represent all of this data and mechanics and everything from this game. It strips out all the flavor text and puts it in a layout that is just much easier to reference at the table. And it also prevents me from having any accidents like spills or greasy pizza fingers or anything getting on my old game. This is my original game from when I was a kid back in 1981. So as a reminder, uh, at the last game, uh, last session, the players had made a decision to travel on this one particular road that I'm going to call the King's Road for these series of videos. And they uh, decided to go to the east. And I had drawn a map of it beforehand in my little planning notebook here. And in that map, it indicated that if they headed to the east, they were going to end up in a town called Ostenswag, which was close to the keep on the borderland. So it's on the border of this kingdom or empire. And past that is sort of like the unknown. It's the uncivilized. It's barbarian tribes. It's things like that. Okay, so that's kind of where we're at. Now, one of the things that happened in that first session is, as a reminder, we, I have five players in my game, so I have my daughter, and she had picked three friends to play with her, and then one of the friend's dads had agreed to play after I sent all the parents an introductory email inviting their, their daughters to play with us. And at the first session, one of the parents, uh, who didn't want to play, but she just kind of wanted to observe and see what was happening, she brought her daughter's younger sister, only, only younger by a year, so just one grade difference, and that younger daughter sat at the table and kind of just watched what was going on. And I realized it was going to be difficult for this parent to try to figure out how to shuttle two kids around with two different schedules and figure out like what to do with the one daughter while the other one was playing D and D every, you know, roughly every month. So I had this in the back of my mind while I was watching this happening. And the younger daughter at the time was pretty shy. She was very quiet, soft-spoken. But she started to kind of comment toward the end of the session and say things like, um, hey, I think you should do this. Or what if you tried that? And one time I think she asked her sister if she could roll the dice just to kind of, you know, kind of participate a little bit. And so when the session was over and we, we always have like a post-game uh, potluck with all the families, all the parents come over, uh, you know, and plus, you know, of course, the one dad's already there. And we take turns moving to everybody's house. So nobody has the um, job of hosting every single time because it is a really big job. But uh, during the potluck dinner, I kind of pulled my daughter aside really quickly and I said, hey, look, I think we might want to invite the uh, younger sister to to your friend. Um, to play the game but it is my daughter's game and and she had picked the people in this game very specifically based on sort of you know making sure that there wasn't going to be any drama with these groups of friends because none of them really go to school together and my daughter said yeah that's that's fine i explained to her why i wanted to invite this this younger sister and my daughter said it was totally cool and so then i approached actually the older sister and i said hey this is totally just between you and me but I would like to invite your younger sister to this game. My you know, daughter has said it's cool, but I only want to do that if it's cool with you. This was you know, during that pandemic time, there had been lockdowns where people were just shut up all the time. And I thought, you know, maybe this older sister, it's possible she's a tween at the time. Like maybe she didn't want to have to spend even more time with her sister. And she was looking at this as an opportunity to have some time with some other friends. So I did give her the option, but she said, no, she was totally cool with inviting her younger sister. So then lastly, I know this is, seems like a long way of going around this, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone was comfortable doing this. So I went to the parents of the girl and I said, hey, we want to invite your other daughter to play in this game if you're cool with that. 
what do you think? And they said, yeah, actually, that would be great. She would love it. I think it would be good for her to kind of have some more socialization, but also it just helped them with their scheduling. And I said, great. And so then I sent, uh, well, I asked the, the girls, she was, this all happened during that potluck thing. I kind of was talking to people individually and she agreed and said, yes, I'd like to be part of this game. Um, but I'm not sure if I want to like commit to it long term. I'm not really like sure what I, how, you know, how I'm going to feel about it. And I said, okay, how about this? How about I create a character for you and you can play it at the next session. And then after that, you can decide if you like it and you want to keep going or if not, and you'll stop and it's fine. And I said, but you know, um, after you decide, if, if you do decide to keep continue playing, you can make your own character. Or you can use this one that I made for you. And she said, hey, that's great. So uh, I got out my trusty notebook. We've talked about this before. And I started making notes for a character for her. And I decided to pick a fighter for her. So just as a reminder, I have three L's in this group. Uh, my daughter is one of them. And their names are, my daughter's character, his name is Cora Netflix. <laughs> she just goes by Cora. We don't use the last names, but it's kind of funny. So just gives you a, kind of a window into their personality when they made these. Uh, her friend made an elf named Holly Short, which I found out like months later was named after a character from the Artemis Fowl series that I've never even heard of. Um, so I didn't know that her character was named on that. And then the third elf uh, was named Clara, and I forget what Clara's last name was. And then I have a cleric played by the dad player, Bartolo the Seeker. Uh, so he's a human cleric of uh, a mystery cult of a god known as the Thrice Great Kewl. And then the fifth player, uh, another girlfriend of my daughter's, is um, was playing a thief named Alex or Alexandra, who like a 12-year-old kind of street urchin thief. So those are the players. So I decided to make a fighter because I kind of thought, you know, we're a little light on some just true muscle in this game. And so I rolled her stats, as you see here. And she was there when I kind of rolled these up. We rolled her starting gold. And then uh, I helped assign equipment for her because, again, she kind of didn't want to do this. She just wanted me to do it for her. And then I had this list of background ideas. So I got this list from Dungeon Craft. I talk about his channel all the time, Dungeon Craft YouTube channel, P Professor Dungeon Master. And if you want to find out, these are like 20 instant backgrounds for um, PCs or even NPCs. So it's episode 123 on the um, Dungeon Craft YouTube channel. And it's just called 20 PC backgrounds for D&D &D and Pathfinder, I think. So uh, he went through them like just over over the video and i actually got my notebook out and wrote him down as, as he was doing it and so i rolled and uh lo and behold i came up with accused of a crime you didn't commit so i actually told the player that i rolled that and asked her hey you know i'm gonna leave it up to you maybe you did commit the crime so what do you think do you want to actually have committed the crime or do you want to have just been accused falsely and you didn't commit and she said oh i think i'd rather prefer that i was accused falsely i didn't commit the crime and i said okay great that's awesome and so uh, I remembered that I had rolled up on my rumor table that there was a feud between these two local barons, but I didn't know what the source of the feud was. And I didn't need to know when I wrote that down. That was just kind of a rumor. And maybe we fall up on it. Maybe we don't. And I decided to use that as an opportunity because the players had heard that rumor while they were um, at the fall festival. Again, that's in my uh, second video in the series. And so I decided that one of the baron's sons had been murdered and that was the cause of the feud because the one baron thought the other baron had paid to have it done and the uh person who was accused of the murder i decided was this player's new character so i named her greta the wanderer was the name i gave the character and so greta had been accused of a murder and she didn't commit it, but she doesn't know who did. She has no idea who set her up. All she knows is that she's been accused of this. And so she fled her hometown uh, to basically to keep her family out of trouble. So she left so that they wouldn't be the brunt of, of any justice that came down. And she has been guarding caravans and stuff like that just to kind of make a little money on the side. And so I told her this. I also told her that she comes from a barbarian tribe. So the barbarian tribes in this part of the world are sort of like looked down on as like second class citizens. So it was an easy thing for people to believe that she would have murdered this guy because barbarians do that kind of thing for money or whatever. So um, and I mentioned that she painted her face with blue war paint. And that was because I found a picture on Pinterest of a warrior woman with dark hair and had like blue face paint. I thought she looked kind of cool. So I used that as, as the character sketch for this character. And uh, you can see the character sheet here. And I have no idea where this picture came from. Like I said, I found it on Pinterest. 
And uh, and so she and the char- the player really kind of liked this character. And then I told her, uh, I gave her that list of like a uh, thing that you love, thing you hate, and a thing you fear. So the thing that she feared is the bounty hunters and the and the justice people coming after her and trying to chase her down for committing this murder that she actually didn't commit. And then the thing that she hated was whoever it was that set her up for this murder. And so that that was sort of her goal was to find out who it was. And then her love was her spear. And so I told her that she carried this spear and just kind of be funny. And I thought this is cool. Of course, none of the players got this reference, but I called her spear destiny and said she'd had it ever since she remembered. And like, she hated to be parted from it. Like she would um, be very unhappy if someone like took it from her or she lost it or something like that. And uh, so that was kind of like this, the background that I gave to this character. So, and, and I gave her the character she had ahead of time. And so she ended up playing in this second session. Okay. So, so that's how I introduced a new player into the campaign. You're going to see how it comes across during the session. And a couple other things here. So I want to talk a little bit about some minimalist world building that I have done. So one of the things that I had done when I was a young kid, shortly after I discovered Dungeons and Dragons, was beginning kind of building a campaign world that I you know, eventually thought I might use uh, to run some games in. And... Uh, I never actually used it as is, but it's changed over the years. So I've been, I've kind of used this variation of this world over time. So one of those ones I've done is a, a third edition campaign that I started in May of 2001. I'll talk about that at some point, but it's actually still going. So it's been over 20 years. We haven't played for a little bit, but uh, you know, we haven't finished it in, in my mind. Um, you know, we, we kind of left off at a place where things could keep going. So I would like to get that back up and running at some point, but it's been, a, it's been probably a couple years, but I, I was using this world. And one of the things that I had done for this world was create all these NPCs. So years ago I had, so this is my little recipe box and I used, used these index cards and I had created all these NPCs. Each one of those is, is an NPC for this world. So when I started this game for my daughter, what I did was I went back through these because every one of these guys, I had a, a, a section called history or aims. And so I was talking about, um, you know, like one of the countries in my world is an empire. And I had had these notes here on, this is one of the first ones that I made. This is the king of that particular empire. And I note, I noted here, I put, he works well with Alvior. I didn't know who Alvior was when I wrote this. I just wrote that down. And I said, and together they're trying to rebuild the country after their naval defeat to the theocracy of Hallmorn over a territorial issue. So again, I didn't know who, what the theocracy of Hallmorn was. But now I know that there was a naval dispute and Hallmorn won. And I said, the king has no sons as of yet. So to me, that meant that was important. So that at least it was important to this particular guy. So all of that could be potential future campaign session planning stuff for, an, for you know, it could be a whole campaign arc or it could be just a particular session, something like that. Um, so I wrote that down. And then I was like, well, now I need to create this guy called Alvior. So I created Alvior. And I noted that like he recognized that the other guy was going to basically be the political and military leader. And so he was focusing on trying to raise the intellectual ability of the citizens and that he has a zoo of strange and exotic creatures. So I call this minimalist world building. I wrote that line down again, not knowing anything about it. But now I have an idea that like this could come up in a game that maybe that's a landmark in this world that there's a zoo of strange and exotic creatures. Maybe the player characters need to find one of those creatures to use for a magical you know, uh, like a component, they need like a, a, a horn or some feathers or something like that. Or maybe one of the creatures gets loose and is rampaging throughout the city and they need to like go and put a stop to it or anything like that. But it becomes a, a list of ideas. So I had tons of these in, in this. I mean, you can see every single one of these had stuff like that. So I dug this box out. I had actually kind of forgotten about it and I saw it on my shelf. And I, so I dug these cards out and I went through and I made a list of all those different ideas that you saw down there. And I put it in this book. I talked about this a little bit in some of my, some of my previous uh, you know, um, videos on this subject, but I wrote down all that little stuff here about all these different areas and like what, what was going on with them as far as like, um, you know, those little things like the king has no sons or, or, you know, such and such is going on. And so that's how I built my campaign world. Uh, so I did talk last time about how I kind of drew a map. I've never used that map. What I did was give a li- the players a list of all the nations. And I kind of put that little information in there. Like um, there's a zoo of strange and, and exotic creatures and it's the biggest in the world and it's in that place. So they have that. And that's kind of like knowledge that they would just have. 
So if they want to go there, that's on them. And if they choose to go there, then I will build that out and I'll spend time developing it. But what I didn't do was write like a long detailed history of all these nations and all the things that have happened over the years, because I don't really need to know that. What I need to know is what do the players want to do next session and then plan for that, right? So uh, I love world building. It's one of the things that being a lot of DMs love to do, and there's nothing wrong with that. I just don't have time to do that kind of stuff anymore. And also what I found in that long running game I was talking about, I did develop a world for that that was just, it was so detailed. And I didn't use probably 95% of the stuff because it never came up in the game. So I wrote details on like the, the migrations of certain faiths and, and all this kind of stuff. And it just didn't have an impact because the players were at the ground level doing these things and, and it didn't really matter to them. So I decided not to do that for my daughter's game. So I'm doing the, again, this minimalist approach. It's why I like random tables so much things like I talked about it in my uh, review on the Tome of Adventure Design. In there, there's also a talk about the Ultimate Toolbox or some of the new monster books, like the new one. I have a short about this for the unboxing for the Monster Overhaul by Skirples. But uh, that book is just full of this kind of stuff where it's these little very creative and evocative um, statements that don't have any detail to them, but they just spark your imagination. And then you can think of so many different ways to use that. And to me, that kind of stuff is so much more helpful than reading uh, you know, six pages on this country that maybe my players are never going to visit, right? So I just don't have time for that. I don't even want to write that kind of stuff anymore. I'd rather write creative prompts for people to use or for myself to use. So that's how I did my world building. So I was getting into this session. Uh, I had the new player and I told her, um, you know, look, you, you're going to be here and I will signal you when it's time for you to kind of like jump in. And she's like, yeah, that sounds great. I can totally do that. So in my notes, planning for this session, I had uh, I had to remind myself of some things that I wanted to take care of. So uh, I did a refresh of the rules and asked them if they had any questions. There really weren't, but it kind of came up during the game. I did ask them about descriptions of violence. So I talked a little bit about this in my session, uh, my session zero video, but uh, I wanted to make sure that as we were talking about things like how comfortable were they with descriptions? Like, what, do they want to gloss over it? Do they want details? And they kind of wanted somewhere in between, but they just wanted to make sure it didn't get too gory. And also, um, one of the players said like, hey, how about um, we can let you know if it's getting too much? And I said, that's a great idea. And she actually did. And it came up during this session. I, I mentioned something and she and she just said, OK, Mr. Thomas, like that's that's enough. And I was like, yep. And that was it. And I kind of learned like that was the limit and I needed to back it down a little bit so I didn't upset her. So and then I asked someone to summarize the last session. And so that was something I do and I still do it to this day in this game. And it helps them remember that they should probably take notes. Now, I'll be the first to admit my daughter is terrible at taking notes. She just doesn't want to. Um, but I do tell her sometimes, like, I'm going to call on you to have you summarize the game because it's not fair. She's the only one that doesn't do it. So when she knows that I'm going to do that, she'll ask her friends ahead of time, like, hey, can you share your notes with me? And she'll go through it like the day before the morning of before the session to kind of refresh her memory. So I ask them to summarize and then everyone kind of jumps in and says, oh, and also this happened or like whatever. But um, over time, that led to probably about five, six, seven sessions into this particular game. I asked Asked them because I was writing the recaps of the sessions and I said hey does any of do any of you want to write the recap and this one girl was like yeah I'd love to do that and I said okay cool why don't you write it in the voice of your character like how did your character perceive what was happening don't just like regurgitate what happened which is what I'd been doing it was a very dry kind of session summary and so she's like yeah that's super cool and so that lasted for a long time and actually the dad player he will still do that for me but I was kind of trying to take turns but again some of the players over time sort of felt like it was homework but it was a fun idea I loved having them do that and at the beginning they did like it they liked the idea of being able to describe what happened by the way their character perceived it I remember one very specific time they went to the barber surgeon to get healed because that's where you could do that and he charges uh, a gold piece or whatever it was I forget what the fee was but he charged a fee to heal wounds but that also came with a free haircut right and so my daughter had her character talk very detailed about the haircut that she got her new haircut and why she picked it and all that kind of stuff it was so funny it was like a huge part of her recap was this thing about the haircut so 
Um, anyway, it was just something fun I tried. You can try that in your games uh, if you have players of the right age that are interested in that kind of thing, because it also allows them to world build. So like the cleric player, he's invented his superiors in the church, and he treats his recap as though he is writing a letter to them, telling them what he's been through. And then he lets me kind of write back or in the game, like what happened. And then sometimes he will write back to himself and say, like, you know, this is what his superior said back. So he's giving me these clues of things that I can use during the game. So I wrote those notes and then I had notes that were going to happen on this um, bone road or king road, whatever you want to call it. And so that leads us to the random table that I was using. And that is in here. So this is my DM notebook again. And so for my second session, uh, I had basically just the notes for this. This is based on, again, Professor Dungeon Master's YouTube channel. Uh, he has a session called The Bone Road. So obviously I borrowed that from him. And I was, uh, you know, I, I did change it a little bit. So I did have a ton of encounters that he didn't have in his table. I added to them from, from my own, uh, you know, design, but also ideas that I'd seen in other books or other blogs or just things online that people talking about, and I added them to the game. So that ended up being the majority of this particular session. There was a combat at the end, but um, the main part of the session was the road encounters that happened. So let's talk about that a little bit. So I'm going to talk about some of these encounters and how I kind of used the randomness element to tie it into things that had already happened during the game. And that was kind of fun because, uh, again, it kind of made the players think that, like, I had some of this stuff planned all along. So when we started out, I mentioned that, you know, they're on the road and how they... Um, you know, remember the words of the fortune teller who talked about how the road was dangerous and, and full of, um, you know, just really, really bad things that could happen. And uh, they see the village behind them. It's on fire as they move into the darkness, but it's a really dark night. It's super cloudy. There are no stars out. Every once in a while, they see a sliver of a moon, but it will disappear. And, you know, I was really trying to kind of set, this, set the mood for this. And uh, we were playing this outdoors at my house in October. It was late October when we had the session. And, um, and so they were, uh, or actually it might've been November, what, what, whatever it was, it was like a, it was a cool fall evening. It was still light when we started playing, uh, but it was getting darker and darker as we were outside we had candles lit and things like that on the tables, uh, so that everybody could see. And I was kind of saying, well, it's kind of a night like this, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's actually much darker. And I talked about how. Uh, they were on this road that was just, you know, overgrown with weeds and centuries of neglect. And I mentioned how like they would trip and stumble and parts of the road would crumble away and they would lose their footing and maybe twist an ankle, but they had to keep going. And they had two people in their group that had remembered to have torches. So the two torch bearers were, were sort of in the front leading them. And then they realized, though, that not only were the torches helping light their way, but they were also acting as a beacon to attract any animals or anything that was out there toward them because they were carrying these light. But so they were sort of stuck, like we need the light, but also we need to be on high alert. And so I talked about a lot of that kind of stuff. I set the wet, what the weather was like. I told them basically, it just feels very unsettling. It's just not, it's not a fun thing for them. And so then I had them start rolling on the table. So I had that random table I showed you. And uh, if you want a version of this, I, I will tweak it and make it different. So I'm not just giving you the one that the professor used in his video. Uh, but if you, I love random road encounter tables. I think it makes travel fun. And that's partly what I'm trying to talk about in this video. So I had the players roll and they would get so tense because they would, they would roll and be like, don't be anything bad. And so I went on this. And so one of the first encounters that happened, uh, well, there was some weather stuff that slowed them down. Uh, they came across a stream full of clear water that was very cool. And I said, you know, you can fill your water skins or anything like that. And then come to find out none of them had actually bought any of those. <laughs> and so this was a lesson for them. Now I could have done the like, you know, adventures are competent. And so you probably would have known to have those. And in the future, you know, I would do that. But again, I was trying to teach them like this is sort of a lesson for knowing that you're prepared appropriately when you're going adventuring. And so we decided that they probably had them but had to drop them really quick when they ran out of town. And so they didn't have any way to keep the water. So they were just like cupping and drinking as much as they could. And then knowing that they were going to have to move on. And 
so uh, th that happened. There was one of the characters, uh, the thief character, actually, when she was on watch at night on her turn at watch, she saw a glowing ring of lights around a little hillock off to the side of the road and she felt drawn to it. So she went over there and it was actually a fairy mound and she witnessed like a fairy dance, essentially. And that's something that like humans typically don't see. But because she stayed and watched it and she didn't interfere with them, she didn't try to talk to them. She just kind of watched from a safe distance to see what was happening. Um, that gave her sort of uh, luck for the next day. So I used a 5e rule. I know, again, a lot of uh, old timers would balk at this, but I basically said the next roll that you make that has any sort of like bad consequence if you fail, you will get advantage on that roll. And so she knew that. So the other thing I had done for the thief character was I'd written this note to her and mentioned that she found it while she was on the road. And it was written from the beggar girl that she had found in the previous town that basically talked to her about how every town has a thieves guild. And when she was traveling, uh, she should look for that, but also told her. Um, and what's funny is she never knows. She doesn't know when this note appeared. They were traveling on this road for days and days. But by the time she found this note, what it said was that the uh, there the town had been destroyed, but some people had survived. They had captured one of the beast-headed creatures, and uh, they killed them. And then they realized it wasn't a beast-headed creature; it was just a human wearing a beast mask and using like the animal horn to make uh, horn uh, the, the animal noises. And his lips had been sewed shut. And so they were kind of freaked out. But um, so she said, you know, just kind of be careful. It looks like this cult is like spreading. And so be on the alert for that. So that was the thief character. And then uh, I had the characters, uh, they rolled uh, on the table. And one of the encounters that they came across were these two guards that were kind of standing there. It was very, they were just lazily lean, leaning on their pole arms and they had some kind of parchment out. And it turned out it was a wanted poster. They were looking for a criminal. So they eyed the characters up and down. They were very gruff. But the characters learned that these two guys were learn looking for this barbarian woman who had killed uh, the Baron's son of the, the barony that was next over. And so that was how I, and so I didn't know that was going to happen. So I had to make that up on the fly when they rolled the, the, the encounter that said that they encountered two guards that had a wanted poster. I had written that in the notes, but I didn't know that the wanted poster was going to be of this new character. Cause at the time I wrote this, I didn't have that character in the game. She came after I developed the table. And so I thought, OK, that's perfect. Like that's that that's very serendipitous that they rolled this result on the table and that worked out to my advantage. So the characters knew that there was this person out there that had murdered the Baron's son. And so they're traveling along and then I rolled an encounter or they rolled. They were rolling uh, and there was a um, coach that was stuck in the mud. And they, they saw some black uh, fletched arrows like black feathers on these arrows. And so. Um, and, and most of the people from the coach were dead and they saw drag marks and things like that. But they um, also saw there was an unconscious woman lying on the ground and they, they realized that it's actually um, she matched the description of the person on the poster. And then I signaled the younger sister of the player and I said, that's kind of your cue. And so she introduced herself and they my players, they questioned the heck out of her. They were so concerned that she actually was a murderer and they didn't want her in the group. But, you know, the dad player met gave me a little bit he's kind of like i think we need a fighter in the group because we need like i trust her and all this because he he knew that like that was her character and so the players you know i think they were kind of teasing her a little bit but they were kind of trying to see like you know how committed was she to playing this and so she decides to stay they accept her into the group and they adventure on the next encounter that was rolled was um a man who was uh dying essentially and he gave them a ring and asked them that they would return it to his fiance who he'd left back at the keep that they were heading to the keep on the borderland so uh and he said you know you can find her and give this ring to her and um if you do you know i would be very appreciative of that so they took the ring they encountered this guy so they're starting but they're starting to you know get the sense of, like this road is dangerous like something had, had attacked these creatures and that was the next thing that happened i mean there again there was a few other encounters that were again more weather-based or um you know nothing that really bad happened it was just you know kind of fun things to talk about but eventually they were ambushed by a group of goblins and they tried to fight back they were very creative. They lit some dead uh, brush on, uh, put some oil on it and like tried to light that on fire. They did kill a lot of goblins that way, but eventually they were overwhelmed. The numbers of the goblins were just overwhelming. They were captured. They wake up 
in a dark cave that's illuminated just by some phosphorescent mushrooms. Again, if you've watched the Dungeoncraft channel, you kind of see where this is going. And um, they needed to escape. Their two wolf pups were being mistreated and teased by the guards who would like tease them with food and then pulled away at the last second. And so one of the players um, that w she had a pet wolf, she found a mouse. She grabbed a mouse and she asked, like, can I try to grab one of these mice? Because I described there was mice running all around the floor. And I said, sure, make a dexterity check. And she did. And so she grabbed a mouse and she threw it over to her wolf who like hungrily ate it because he hadn't been fed. And so then the thief player, she, a little, uh, she can be a little crazy at times. She said, I'm going to grab a mouse too. Can I grab it? And she also has a wolf. So I thought she's going to throw the mouse to the wolf. And she said, I'm going to look the goblin dead in the eye. And then I'm just going to squeeze the mouse to death in my hand. I was, I was like, whoa, what is going on here? And um, so, but I rolled a reaction. And it was like the goblins were scared of her. And so the goblins end up chatting. They were playing a, a game with some finger bones and stuff like almost like a dice game but with like i said with finger bones and they were wearing necklaces that had ears on them and that was one of the things that they'd noticed um when they found the uh Greta the wander character a lot of the dead bodies that were by the coach um the ones that hadn't been dragged off uh, their ears had been cut off and we realized that they wear these necklaces sort of like as a sign of pride and um but also it's like that's how they exchange value in the tribe is how how many ears you have hanging on your necklace and so um, they, uh, the goblins start talking and uh, the two elf, two of the elf players had written goblin down as languages that they knew. So they decided that, uh, or I told them that they, they could hear what the goblins were saying. And they were talking about which one of them they were going to basically kill and cook and eat. And so now they're aware that like goblins eat humans and elves. And so the two of the goblins tried to get one of the characters out of a cage. There was a little scuffle. And the Greta the Wander was one of the characters that was in there. They'd been stripped of all their weapons, but she said, I want to kind of run and tackle him. So the cleric player tried to run and tackle, and he kind of did. But then the Greta the Wander character said, like, I'm going to grab the goblin. And she rolled a natural 19 on her roll. And so I kind of let her do like some little maneuvers on the fly. And they captured this guy and they... Um, basically the other goblin was trying to close the gate. And so they used the body of the other goblin that they grabbed and used him to stop the gate from closing. And they rolled out and they were able to eventually kill the remaining goblin in the room. One of them ran for help. And so um, one of the goblins was trapped under the gate and then they killed the other one. And so now they were stuck in the dark uh, with just these like very faintly lit phosphorescent mushrooms, no equipment uh, that they can use to get out. And that was going to be the start of the next session. So that's how we ended. And uh, so it was a ton of fun. We got a lot of stuff done during the game. And uh, the players had a lot of fun. We introduced that new uh, player to the game. She decided to keep going and keep playing that um, Greta the Wander character. And so we'll talk more about that next. But that's how I introduced a new character to the game and how I handle some road encounters and some minimalist world building. Please leave me a comment below. Let me know what you think of this video, how you do world building, how you do road encounters, or how you introduce a new player to the game. I'd love to hear your ideas. Let's share them in the community here. Also below, you'll find places where you can join me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and you can visit my shop to help support the channel by buying a t-shirt or something poster mug something like that uh so with that uh if you could just uh last thing uh like the video and please subscribe to my channel i would really appreciate it thank you so much for watching have a happy gaming stay safe and i'll talk to you next time and now for the bonus content what i was drinking while i was prepping my notes for this video and what i was listening to so i was having some frenette bronca this is an Italian Amaro. It's extremely bitter. It's very polarizing. It's got a little bit of a menthol taste to it. I love it. I'm very accustomed to it. Uh, it's also known in the industry for people who um, like this kind of detail. It's, it's called a bartender's handshake. So a lot of times uh, bartenders at the end of their shift, they will have a little bit of, of Fernet. Um, I'll, my local bartender will give me a shot of this when I am finishing at the bar. When I leave, she'll give me a little bit. And I've actually been in a restaurant in New York that was recommended to me at, from a bar up the street. And when I told them that, they actually gave me a glass of Fernet, put some uh, plastic wrap over it, and asked me to walk back up the street and give it to the bar as a thank you. So, uh, I really like it, but again, it's it's uh, an accustomed taste. Listening to, I was listening to Revolver, Beatles, 1966. This and Rubber Soul were kind of like the two albums that really began to redefine them away from the mob top group and into sort of the more, um, I guess, maybe serious music that they had in their later career. Okay, so that's it for this uh, part of the video. And again, thank you very much for watching. Cheers.